All right. Uh, so cool to see lots of people I don't know, and I'm honored you want to come hear me talk. Um, so, hi, my name's Carrie, and I'm going to talk to you today about monorepos, what they are, uh, and how using them had sped up the pace at which my team and I deliver better and more secure front-end applications. Um, and before I start talking about that, I want to get an idea of who I'm talking to here. So, quick raise of a hand, who's heard of a monorepo? Oh, like all of you, cool. Um, who uses monorepos? Quite a half of you, cool. And like who starts to feel their heart race, hand sweat, and a feeling of unease at the pit of your stomach at the idea of putting code from multiple projects into a single code base? <laughs> uh-huh, about just as many as those who use it, cool. Um, and if that's your reaction, um, I totally get it because I was really skeptical when my charismatic, tech-enthusiastic team lead came and suggested this approach. I mean, it sounds like something that can quickly become a tightly coupled stack of cards that will come tumbling down if you look at it the wrong way or, you know, if someone in the neighboring office sneezes. Um, and behold, the type of system I just described is infamous in our community. It is the feared and dreaded monolithic application. Ooh. <laughs> right? Um, but it doesn't have to be like this in a monorepo. And this is one misconception that I will try to disband today. So, what is a monorepo? A monorepo is a software development approach where code for multiple projects or components is stored in a single repository. Um, so let's, for simplicity, say that the opposite of a monorepo is a polyrepo. So with a polyrepo strategy, um, you have an app or a project, then you store it in its own repository. So typically a Git repository on GitHub or something like that. Um, and then, if you have some shared services that are used by more than one application, um, <coughs> then these each have their own repository as well. And typically, you'll publish them to NPM so they can be shared across projects. Um, in comparison, in a monorepo, they're all stored in the same repository. So when you clone your repo, you're going to get lots of code, and not just the code uh, for your project. Right, so as the illustration tries to show, having code organized in a monorepo doesn't automatically mean that you're going to have a tightly coupled architecture, or any other architecture for that matter. Um, you certainly still can, and it's probably a good idea to organize your code in small, independent, and self-contained components with well-defined boundaries and interfaces. Um, but fundamentally, the only difference is where you put your code. Uh, nonetheless, the impact of this decision can be large. Um, so why would you choose to do this um, instead of splitting it up into multiple repositories? Um, I'll get into the general reasons for why you want to do this, but first I want to give you a quick introduction to our monorepo. Um, so, our monorepo for front-end apps <coughs> came to be as a proof-of-concept summer project. In the summer of 2020, four students uh, created our front-end monorepo to host three applications and some shared libraries to support them. Um, so, one of these apps has passed the test of time, uh, and if you're curious about the sun conditions on a particular property, uh, then you can go to our web shop and check out our uh, app. It's called Solforo. Um, but anyways, today our monorepo has 24 uh, React applications. Um, many of these are demo applications and internal tools, but we also have like a couple of important ones in there, like with real customers. Um, and to support these, uh, we have 81 shared libraries. So 81 sounds like a lot, um, but many of these are really small. So we have, 
for example, a library for each external API we call. And we have a library just for dealing with cadaster IDs. Yes, they're complicated, but I digress. Um, so the activity and scale of our monorepo is relatively small. Um, to give you an idea, last month we had 26 contributors who uh, together merged 151 pull requests <laughs> to the main branch. Um, and we haven't just put lots of code into a single repository. To manage all these projects, we use a monorepo build tool called NX. Um, and in addition to code, we have some internal tools, uh, developer tools and docs in our monorepo to help users get going quickly. Um, and finally, our monorepo has one shared CI CD pipeline to get all these great apps into production and delivering value to our customers. So the question is, what does a monorepo give us? And why do we choose to organize our code this way? Did you know that Google, Meta, Microsoft, Uber, Airbnb, and Twitter all employ very large monorepos with varying strategies to scale build systems and version control software with large volume of code and daily changes? It's true, they use monorepos. Um, but the fact that these big successful companies use monorepos, um, of course, doesn't mean it's a good idea for everybody. In fact, the chances are high that the scale and context of your projects are widely different from theirs. Um, but it does give an indication, at least, that it's not a totally bad idea, I think. So, big guys use it, bad reason. Um, but there are some actual benefits of using monorepos, and I'm going to go through and explain each one of them. Um, monorepo benefit number one. It's faster to get new projects up and running. So our monorepo helps us here in two ways. First, we have custom generators. So custom generators in our monorepo helps us set up new applications with company-specific boilerplate code. Um, for example, one of our app generators will generate code with authentication and our design system set up and ready to use. So you run the command, serve up your app, and you're good to go. Um, so you may argue this is not a monorepo advantage because there's nothing stopping you from making templates and custom generators in its own repo. And it's a good point. Um, however, an advantage of having this in a monorepo setting is um, that it's much easier to keep these up to date as your internal dependencies evolve. Um, and I'm going to talk more about uh, this later. So we've got our app created. Um, next thing you typically want to do is get it into production. So when you develop in our monorepo, there's no need to set up your own CI CD pipeline. No need to configure YAML files and suffering from the subsequent PPSD, you know, post pipeline stress syndrome, um, each time you want to make an app. This stuff, it's set up and ready to use in our monorepo. Um, so, a bit about how this works. Uh, our CI CD pipeline looks something like this. Each pull request is going to trigger lint, test, and build stage of the pipeline. NX helps us to make sure that we only run these tasks for projects affected by the change. Moreover, NX and NX Cloud will help us with caching and distribution, so it all runs quite fast. After a merge, um, the pipeline <laughs> is triggered again. And again, the pipeline will lint, test, and build affected projects. If all goes well here, uh, we will proceed and deploy our application to a development environment, or we. The pipeline will do it for you. Um, and if all goes well here, uh, we go ahead and deploy to production. Um, and in addition, affected libraries that are set up to publish to our NPM feed are going to do that, so that users that are outside our monorepo also can benefit from the changes. Um, the time it takes to lint, test, and build really varies depending on three things. So 
how many build, ag build agents are available, um, how many projects are affected, uh, and how many cache hits do we get. So in the best case, when just one project is affected or every task can just pull from the cache, um, it can take three minutes. Um, and in the worst case, when 81 libs and 24 apps are affected by the change, and it's the first time being run, um, it can take about 35 minutes. But the fun thing, though, is that because of remote caching, which NX gives us out of the box, um, the total time for the merge pipeline, which also includes deployments, um, is in the same range. Um, and yeah, I know 35 minutes is too slow, but we're going to make it faster. Right, so that's how it works in our monorepo, if you were wondering. Um, but the point is that this is already set up in our monorepo, so teams can quickly get new apps and changes deployed without having to configure YAML pipelines. Next monorepo benefit, fewer bugs in production. So having code in a monorepo such as ours can help limit bugs that are allowed to pass into the main branch and, as a result, into production. Uh, and this is because when all code is in one place, uh, you're immediately going to get feedback if your changes are breaking some dependent services. So, for example, in this situation. <coughs> if a new feature is needed in the authentication library, it's easy to apply the changes locally and immediately test that it works like it should on whatever app needs a change. However, if the change happens to break some other app, um, then this merge will automatically be blocked by the lint test and build stage of the pull request pipeline. And when this happens, you can see which command broke the build and locally run it and reproduce the error. Next, monorepo benefits. So monorepos can improve collaboration. And to understand the benefits of a monorepo for collaboration, um, it can be useful for us to explore how a polyrepo strategy is, or can be, sorry, it doesn't have to be, can be harmful to collaboration. <coughs> so polyrepos are really great for autonomy uh, because it allows teams to choose their own tools uh, and libraries and they can decide who, what, when, and how changes get pushed to production. Um, it's really super, uh, but it comes because of isolation. And isolation can be harmful for collaboration. So when working on a project in its own repository, I think it can be hard to see the big picture. I mean, the lines in this graph represent the relationships between the parts of a system or application. And these lines don't go away just because code is split into their own repositories. Or maybe sometimes they do. So why, why can this happen? Well, for one, maybe teams know, don't know about a shared service. Um, maybe the shared service doesn't have a necessary feature the team needs. Um, or maybe it's just too much hassle to integrate with the shared service that what teams end up doing is copy-pasting code and implementing it themselves. Don't judge, you've all done this. <coughs> so in this case, uh, you've got the issue of lots of teams implementing their own ever-diverging version of the same thing with varying degrees of quality. Wouldn't it be better to do the thing once and make sure it's done right? In a monorepo, it's easy to find shared modules and examples of their use because it's all right there in the same repository. Um, also, it's much easier to see how each model is connected to each other. Uh, and NX even has a tool to draw this graph for you. As a result, shared services become less of a black box and it becomes easier to integrate and contribute to these services. Ah, gotcha, right? I just said polyrepos are more inclined to have less coupling and monorepos encourage more coupling. 
Ugh, stupid monolith go go away. We got to talk about boundaries. So, yes, monorepos make it easier to reuse code and inevitably invite stronger coupling. Therefore, to achieve the kind of collaboration that's sustainable in the long run, it's vital to have well-defined boundaries, clear ownership, and delegation of <coughs> responsibilities. So, let's talk about boundaries. Our monorepo management tool, again, helps us here. So, with NX, each library works like an API. It's got a public-facing interface, which defines how users are allowed to interact with the library. Then, importing and using code that it's not made available through the public interface will be prevented by a grumpy IDE and failed linting. And these same mechanisms will also prevent users from adding circular dependencies, for instance. Um, and with NX, you can even add tags to libraries um, to prevent people from using them at all. So, if you add a tag to your library, then only other uh, projects with this tag are allowed to use the library. Yeah, so that's boundaries. Um, but clear ownership is also really important. So, clear ownership is easily achieved when teams are running their own repositories. Um, but in a monorepo, the lines can appear more blurred. But I believe it's both important and possible to keep clear ownership and responsibility for various services in a monorepo. Um, and it's simple, really. Uh, if you build it, you own it. And if you break it, you fix it. Um, to achieve this in our monorepo, we use branch policies applied to individual subfolders of the repository. So, these policies will ensure that all changes made must be approved by the responsible team. This way, teams have full control of changes that happen to their code. Um, I believe this encourages loose coupling and making good abstractions because teams are going to have to pay the price of coordinating changes with others as soon as their change also requires changes across other projects. Next monorepo benefit, better internal dependency management. So a major benefit of using a monorepo is that it really simplifies the management of internal dependencies. So when I say internal dependencies, I mean the libraries that we make ourselves. So not the external NPM packages we download into our um, applications. <coughs> There's our separated from our application code, um, but the apps depend on them to work. So, for example, your authentication libraries and the components of your design system. And having all these in a monorepo means that we have a single source of truth. There's only one true version of our internal dependencies, and that is the one running in the main branch. As a result, you don't have to deal with juggling versions and ending up in the dreaded state of dependency hell. So, you know, when you depend on a package that depends on a specific version of another package, but then, like, another package you use depends on a version that's incompatible with that other package that the other package needed. And then your, like, console goes, Oh, I can't resolve your dependencies, and I'm not going to let you build your app, blah, blah, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Dependency hell, yeah? If all your internal dependencies are in the same repo, then at any point in time, there's only going to be one version of each dependencies, and these will be perfectly compatible. Yay! No dependency hell. So, the next benefit of monorepos. Better internal external dependency management. Um, so there's a question mark here because while there are many benefits to external dependency management in a monorepo, this is probably the most challenging thing we deal with. So by external dependencies, I'm talking about those dependencies that are not made by us. 
Um, in our case, the npm packages we install in our repository. For example, Re React or Material UI. Um, our monorepo has a single package JSON file to manage external dependencies. And that means that all projects in the monorepo have the same version of each external dependency. Ash. Oh man, this guy just came back again. So with external dependencies, we don't have the source code in our monorepo, which makes sense because we're not maintaining these packages. But it does mean that for these dependencies, we need to manage versions. Uh, and managing and updating external dependencies can be a real chore. I mean, it's something you just have to do, right? And the effects aren't even visible. And working on it will prevent you from making features and developing your apps. Also, dependency hell. Not fun. So managing external dependencies in a monorepo is not easier. In fact, it's probably harder because you got more projects that need to work with the updates and, well, you yeah, probably have more dependencies you have to deal with. So, since major external dependencies upgrades are possibly the largest pain point in working with the monorepo, um, here's a tip from me that's helped us. Um, so, try to do the upgrade uh, without upgrading. Makes sense, right? Uh, hmm? Quite center, right? Um, so what do I mean? Well, when working in a monorepo with lots of activity, you really want to avoid having one ginormous pull request uh, because uh, with all the necessary changes. Because by the time you get it working and all the teams have approved the change, um, your main branch is going to have moves on and it's going to be impossible to merge these changes. So, for example, when we upgraded from React 17 to React 18, most of the necessary changes for things to work in React 18 also worked in React 17, even though they weren't mandatory here. So what we did was, um, we locally upgraded to React 18 um, and saw that all the apps were breaking. Um, and then we put in the work and got one single app working with React 18. Then, since these changes were compatible with React 17, we could merge the code changes um, while um, not yet doing the React 18 upgrade. So we repeated this until all apps were compatible with React 18. And that way, we could make the upgrades in many small steps and on a per app basis, um, so that when the time came to actually make the job jump, it wasn't such a big deal. Uh, and of course, every upgrade is different, and this is not always going to be possible, um, so you're going to have to adapt. Uh, another example of a larger upgrade was React Router. So, same, same, a little bit different. Um, React Router was actually pretty smooth because they provided a compatibility package which could run alongside the old version. Um, so with this upgrade, you could gradually migrate apps to the compatibility package. Um, and then again, when it came time to make the job actual upgrade, it was trivial. So yeah. External dependency management in a large repo is harder than in a small repo with less code. That's obvious. Um, but nonetheless, there are several advantages of having to do this. Um, first advantage is you really quickly and easily get an overview of your external dependencies. And this is great when you want to check for if you're following open source policies or when the security people come asking you questions. Um, if you do have a vulnerable package uh, that you discover, well, then you only need to patch it one place. And there's a single pipeline that's going to roll out this patch to all your apps. Next advantage of this way of working is we're in it together, right? So. When working in a monorepo like ours, you're going to have 
uh, lots more people interested in the health of your repo and making sure it stays up to date. And during a more significant upgrade, um, you're going to have more projects and more people in a similar situation, uh, most likely with similar issues. So instead of everyone struggling alone in their own lonely repositories, we can face these challenges together. Uh, and I find it easier to give and receive help when people understand your context, uh, when you have an abundance of examples and you can quickly reproduce issues. So, next benefit of this method of external dependency management is when you're working on a long, large, important, and heavily used repository, then automating your dependency management <laughs> as much as possible is going to give you much greater gains than if you did it in a smaller repo that only your team cares about. And automating stuff is fun. So, for example, um, we've made a script that uses NX's dependency graph to list unused dependencies, so we can delete them. Um, and by applying automation, we can make sure that upgrades happen more frequently, meaning that we take smaller steps at a time, and uh, upgrades become less of a big deal. Um, and finally, despite individual upgrades being more work in a monorepo than with a polyrepo, I do believe that the cumulative time that would have been spent and the number of people having to be involved is probably less in a monorepo than with a polyrepo strategy. So, next benefit. Another nice effect of having all your code in one place is that making changes and bug fixes to libraries and getting them rolled out to all your apps becomes really easy. So, for example, say we want to do something small, like total company rebrand. Now, I found this old logo, which I quite like. How will we go about changing this logo? Operation, new logo. So first, how would this look in a polyrepo strategy? Well, it's not too complicated, right? You're going to go find your logo library in its logo repository and make the necessary code changes. I don't know, change the SVG file or something like that. Um, then you're going to want to publish uh, your changes, um, however this works. So let's uh, say you have CI CD set up and you merge the changes and your package gets published. Next, you need to broadcast to all the teams about this really cool new feature that they need to integrate into their projects. So, for each project that uses the logo library, whenever the responsible team has the time, they have to go and upgrade the library, check everything looks okay, and hopefully, you know, it fits with the other dependencies they have. Um, and they want to then publish uh, their app with the upgrade. Yep. Um, and how long this will take in a polyrepo strategy is really hard to say for two reasons. So, firstly, there's a for loop here uh, of potentially unknown length, uh, and we need to know which repository needs to apply the changes and which team is responsible. Also, this whole process is asynchronous, so teams need to prioritize making the change and will do it when they get the time. Oh, and plot twists. What if Team X, like a week later, discovers a bug or breaking change in the upgraded logo library? Well, we got to start the whole process over again. In comparison, how would this look um, in a monorepo? Well, it's easy. So step one is the same, um, except we don't have to go looking for the code in some other repository. And we can immediately see the impact of the change on all dependent projects. Then, when we're happy with the changes, we'll make a pull request and merge them. This will trigger our CI CD pipeline that will deploy changes to production for all affected applications, uh, which is going to be most of them in this case. 
right? And that's it. In total, we can get the change out to all apps in one to two hours. And just give me a sec, let me clean up here. Right, that's better. <coughs> so, the point of this example is to illustrate that money repos make it much easier to make changes to your internal dependencies. Uh, and why is that? Well, firstly, there's lots fewer steps. Um, also, when making changes in a monorepo, you can immediately see the effect that your change will have on all its dependent projects. So tests in your own and other projects will hopefully uncover if you've made some breaking changes and you're able to spin up uh, all these applications and see how the change will look. Uh, third advantage is it's much faster. So changes get applied to all affected projects immediately. No for loop, no async business. Which brings me to the next advantage of the monorepo strategy. So the team responsible for the logo library didn't need to communicate or coordinate with any other team to get their changes applied. Team autonomy for the win, right? Yeah. So on the other hand, the nice thing about a polyrepo strategy is that teams have full control of how and when they apply the change. And you could argue that for something as impactful as a logo change, maybe you want that. So, okay. but. You have options in a monorepo here. So one thing you could do is versioning. And I know it sounds hypocritical given my whole point about monorepos being single version. Um, but it's an option. So in this scenario, you'd make a new library. Call it, I don't know, new logo or logo 2023. Um, and teams can start using this whenever they're ready. Uh, and since all projects are in your monorepo, uh, you still have full control of which projects are still using the old one, and you can start chasing down people when they haven't migrated yet. Finally, um, when everyone's over, you can delete the old logo library. Um, another option is to use a feature toggle. So lots of ways this can be implemented, but uh, one way is that you'll implement the logo library in such a way that the old logo, um, sorry, the new logo just shows up in your development and local environments, but then the old logo is still showing in production. This way, teams can opt in to have the new logo shown in production uh, when they're ready. Um, and the final option is you could communicate. Uh, so. Simply apply the changes and ask teams to spin up the app and verify that it's okay to merge. And if your monorepo is small, this can also work. So logo library and updating a logo, it's a silly example. But now imagine that instead of updating a logo, uh, the change you want to make is to patch a known vulnerability in some external dependency. So in this scenario, um, being able to move really fast and not involving too many people is a huge advantage. Um, another change you might want to make is to move your apps to a new hosting platform. Um, so question, has anyone here been part of a mass migration to the cloud? Oh, just me? Oh, a couple, okay. Well, we have. Um, in fact, one of the first things I did in my professional career was to migrate about 30 backend services, mainly .NET APIs, from running on-prem to being hosted in the cloud. Uh, and this meant going into 30 different repositories with 30 slightly different pipelines and versions of dependencies and making the necessary upgrades and changes. Um, it took us months, and it wasn't just my team doing this. So in our monorepo, we've got one single pipeline and a standardized way of deploying and building our apps. And as a result, we can experiment with different hosting platforms. And if we get it working for one, chances are high it's going to work for all of them. 
uh, with minimal to no involvement from other teams. Yeah. Monorepo benefit number seven. Old code gets maintained. So just by being in a monorepo, old code is going to get maintained. Older projects that aren't actively being worked on will automatically and continuously get updates and changes applied to them. So for example, your logo updates, critical bug fixes, and external dependency upgrades. Um, it doesn't come for free, though. So especially when it comes to updating external dependencies with breaking changes, project owners they're going to need to confront their own code, make adjustments, and verify changes. And this forces teams to continuously consider if the project is important enough to keep around. And if the answer is no, well, then code will get removed from the main branch and forever live on in Git memory. Um, and we call this process graveyarding. So the continuous maintenance and deletion of unnecessary code, um, I find, is really useful for preventing the buildup of technical debt. And then another monorepo benefit is standardization. So standardization helps to reduce cognitive load and make services scale better. So our CTO, hey, Maurice. He's back here. Uh, he recently showed us this analogy relating to standardization and scaling. So he said, pets don't scale because when you need to treat every case or service individually, it's going to consume so much more time and effort if you standardize and treat your services more like cattle. Um, Forsgren, Humble, and Kim write in their book, Accelerate, that there is a place for standardization, particularly around architecture and configuration of infrastructure. Um, so this is what we try to do. Um, we standardize our deployment pipeline, which I've already talked about, um, which means, again, teams can practice continuous delivery out of the box, don't have to configure their own YAML pipelines. Um, and despite the shared pipeline, um, teams can deploy their things relatively independently, or at least independent of unrelated services, with the help of NX. Um, so here's another quote of a quote that I also read in Accelerate. Um, Debugging problems with someone else's code gets a lot harder and is basically impossible unless there is a universal standard way to run every ser service in a debuggable sandbox. So we have this in our monorepo. Um, we have a debuggable sandbox, and it's called localhost. So projects in our monorepo, they all have the same bundler, linter, and test runner, uh, which makes it really easy for anyone to spin up any project uh, and debug issues through multiple services at the same time. Yeah, so those were the benefits of using a monorepo. Let's talk about the bad stuff. Like, what can go wrong in a monorepo? What could possibly go wrong if you put all your eggs in one basket? Truth is, lots of stuff can go wrong. Um, so one thing is broken main branch. A broken main branch is when some bug someplace has been allowed to get merged uh, into the main branch. And this can cause apps to break, or it can block continuous delivery uh, and block people from getting their changes out. Um, it's always a risk, and it's bad when it happens in a small repo, but worse when it happens in a monorepo, because, well, you can take down all your stuff. That sucks. All right, so story time. Not too long ago, um, I was working on our monorepo pipeline and migrating it from Windows build agents to running on Ubuntu build agents. Um, I'd gotten it all working and even tested deploying one of the less important apps to the dev environments and saw that everything rendered OK. So all seemed fine, and I was really excited because 
everything seemed much quicker on the Ubuntu agents. So after a review from a teammate with a comment, I trust you on this one. I mean, how is he supposed to verify it anyways? Uh, we merged the changes and apps got deployed. So 20 minutes later, I hear from another teammate that our apps, or one of our apps is not working. And we all scramble and discover that none of the monorepo apps are getting any of their environment variables. E. Panic button time. Um, so we need to roll back. Um, and how did we do this? Well, first we have to go and look at our pipeline runs and find a pipeline run that rolled out all the applications so that we could rerun this and come back to a working state. Uh, next, we had to monitor our pipeline and cancel all new pipeline runs um, to prevent rolling out the bug again. Uh, simultaneously, we wanted to revert the bad commit that caused the bug. Um, and when this was done, we could turn the pipeline back on and apologize very sincerely to everybody. And also learn from what happened. So the consequence of this was 50 minutes of a broken main where people couldn't push changes uh, to their apps. Um, and a bunch of broken apps. So at this point, we're pretty happy that we only have a couple of important apps in our mod repo. Um, but also, as a result, we applied some measures. So after this happened, we added end-to-end -end tests to ensure that we do, in fact, get environment variables. Uh, and we made some measures to make it easier to roll back all apps. So for example, we want to have nightly builds, so we have checkpoints where we can easily find a pipeline to roll back to. Um, and a bunch of more stuff. But the point is, if you're going to put all your eggs in one basket, it's really worth investing in building a good, solid, and rugged basket, and to have a repair kit ready for if it does break, if you get my analogy. So another monorepo risk is slow builds. Um, and this can happen, uh, but luckily, when working locally uh, with NX or with any with monorepo build tools like NX, you will only ever be building projects needed to run your app. And when it comes to the pipeline, NX also helps us with making sure that only affected projects get uh, built and tested. Moreover, they allow you to distribute these uh, tasks running to multiple machines and provide remote caching. So I think slow builds don't need to be an issue. Um, another objection I've heard to using monorepos is um, that when repositories get too large, Git, Git operations like cloning and blame can get really slow. So Google have even made their own version control system to deal with their enormous repository. Um, honestly, at this point, I don't have a really good answer to this. Uh, I'm not sure at exactly what point a repository becomes too big for Git to handle. Um, however, at our current scale, it really hasn't been an issue. Uh, and from my limited research, there are many things we can do to prevent this. Uh, and I believe we have quite some time to figure it out. Um, next risk bugs can roll out to unknowing app owners. So remember, with our current monorepo setup, if changes are made to core library, uh, this is going to trigger build and releases of all affected projects. And if the change doesn't alter the public interface, then this can happen without affected projects being evolved. Um, so yes, this means bugs can roll out to apps. Um, but the upside is teams can work autonomously and you also get the bug fixes for free. Um, and you can reduce the risk of other teams introducing bugs to your app by writing good tests and testing the assumptions you have to other services. Uh, next monorepo risk is less freedom. So when using a monorepo, there will likely be less freedom. So 
using a monorepo will force teams to use certain tools. For example, when using our monorepo, you have to use NX, uh, TypeScript, and React. Um, also, you can't deploy your services completely independently. So if you change your service, all its, all its dependent services are going to be built, tested, and deployed. Uh, and this might be annoying if you just want to change a small thing in your app and don't want to be bothered by other people's stupid code. Um, but I would argue that it's a small price to pay because, as I mentioned earlier, this will prevent bugs from getting deployed to production. Um, also, as a code owner in the monorepo, you have to update on someone else's schedule. So for a monorepo strategy to be successful, um, updates, they have to be frequent and small, uh, which means app owners can't delay upgrades to more suitable time. Um, the advantage, though, is that you do get a lot of support um, and some minor upgrades for free. Um, yeah, but in the end of the day, uh, less freedom is a trade-off for standardization uh, and scale. And final monorepo risk is messy, unmaintainable code. So the monolith ghost is always lurking. When you put code in one place and make it really easy to share, there's always a risk of things getting complicated. So there's a trade-off between not repeating yourself and increased coupling that um, you're going to have to monitor. And it's going to need constant care to prevent uh, this from happening. So. Let's conclude. How has monorepos made us faster, better, and safer? Using a monorepo has made it easier to create new apps uh, and shared libraries because of custom generators and that create the necessary boilerplate code for us. Uh, and because of a shared pipeline uh, for continuous delivery already being set up and ready to use. It's also given us a shortened feedback loop for changes so you can easily and quickly uh, get changes deployed to multiple apps. Remember, no for loop and no async business. Also, <coughs> Monorepo saves us time by eliminating the need to manage versions of our internal dependencies. How have they made us better? Well, using a Monorepo means uh, continuous deployments, uh, sorry, continuous improvements are being made to the entire portfolio, uh, even the projects that aren't actively being developed. Using a monorepo improves collaboration by improving visibility of shared services and increasing the ease of integrating with them, which means that we can make more shared services and can invest in making high quality services instead of having teams implement their own uh, versions with varying degrees of quality. How has Monorepo improved security? Well, by using a Monorepo, we ensure that old code gets maintained and patched. And this prevents services from being forgotten and falling behind on important security updates and patches. Uh, in addition, our Monorepo has a defined decommissioning process, which ensures that unused or unimportant apps uh, and projects will get deleted. Moreover, our monorepo enforces good continuous delivery practices out of the box. And this ensures that code must pass automated tests before being allowed into production and gives a standardized way to quickly roll back apps uh, if they should be necessary. Furthermore, by having a shared set of dependencies, you really quickly get and easily get an overview. Uh, in other words, we've got all the bad practices in one place, which means uh, this really simplifies any review process and makes it easier to enforce policies, uh, for example, relating to the use of external dependencies. So that if a vulnerability is discovered at some point, this can quickly be patched in multiple projects with a single commit. So. Should you use a monorepo? <laughs> All right. That's cool to hear. 
we have a yes over here. So for us in our situation and at our scale, we've had lots of benefits of monorepos, uh, of our monorepo strategy. But our monorepo is tiny and has a relatively small number of contributors. <coughs> Um, and as I hope I've managed to communicate, um, there are some not insignificant challenges that you have to deal with if you choose this approach. And these just get bigger as your monorepo scales. So it's continuous work and requires a strong collaborative culture to keep it working smoothly, smoothly and growing dynamically. So I would say monorepo can be good, um, but other strategies are not wrong. And in the end of the day, it's maybe how you choose to collaborate and how you architect your solutions uh, that's going to be more important than where you store your code. So that's all I had for you today. Um, thanks so much for listening. We've got questions. Cool. <laughs> yes. So, can you show an example of the pipeline YAML and the NX code? Ooh. Um, I don't think I want to do that on the spot. Um, but is there something in particular you're wondering about? What kind of build agents are you using or what CI system are you using? Yeah, so we're actually in uh, Azure DevOps. Okay. Um, and we have a dedicated team that's. Um, maintains these build agents for us. Um, so all, all I know is there are Ubuntu agents and they work for us. So. But you used to use NX also for Windows? Um, yep. Okay. It works on Windows. Um, and we have developers who work on Windows or on Mac uh, or on Linux. Um, so it works. But it seems to me that uh, like NX at least was made for Windows last. Uh, and it works a bit better on yeah, your Ubuntu and your Mac OS. Mm. Did that answer your yeah. question? Yeah. Yes? I believe you said you had 160 contributors? Uh, 26. 26, okay. Yeah. Can you share some details on how many teams, uh, what is each team doing? Are they both doing apps and libraries? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So, um, my team, where there's six of us, um, and we probably own like 80% of the code in the monorepo. So we've got most of the core, core tools, um, and we've been like playing in there on our own for a couple of years, and just recently started getting people from the outside inside. Um, and yeah, so we people from outside our team. Uh, now we have a design system, which is a separate group of people. Uh, and then we have some new apps coming in. Um, yeah, but it really helps that uh, my team have been in there for a while. We've been able to experiment. And uh, also, we can do the grunt work of the upgrades, get all the core services working <laughs> uh, before we start bothering <laughs> other people with uh, updating their things. Um, so that's how it is right now. Um, but of course, this is not going to scale. Um, we can't uh, do all the things. And uh, yeah, just maintaining and coordinating this monorepo is yeah, going to need more and more work as this thing scales. Um, but that's where we are right now. Yeah, And uh, you maybe saw we do publish some stuff to NPM. So I mean, our company has been around for 60 years, and we've got lots of apps. Uh, so, yeah, not all apps are getting into the monorepo at one time, and but we want people to be able to use the design system and these things. Um, so that's kind of a compromise, I guess. Um, but it works works okay. Um, the only problem is many times we've ended up breaking things for people outside the monorepo, and then, uh, well, you don't really find out before someone comes and tells you. Yes. So you just mentioned this uh, front end monorepo. Mm -hmm. Is it advisable to keep different layers in the monorepo? Uh, like uh, front end, back end? Uh, oh, to have uh, more of your stack. Yeah. Um, so make complete monolithic. Uh, yeah. 
Um, so we haven't chosen to do that currently at our company because like anything, you want to do things gradually, uh, I think. Um, but in my private uh, monorepo, um, <laughs> everyone's got a private monorepo, right? Um, well, then I have uh, also my C Sharp. So I make my, uh, my front end in uh, React, and then I have some C Sharp function, function apps that I put in there as well, um, and then deploy them to an Azure Static web app. Um, with kind of the same thing. So I get advantage from this because I can update my back end and my front end in the same commit and don't have to do this whole game with making it backwards compatible and, you know, uh, back and forth. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> Would I advise jumping right into that uh, in an established uh, company? Maybe not. But if you're small and starting out, Sure, try it, and uh, I mean, as they say in the Fjellvet Regler, it's never too late to change your mind. <laughs> yeah. um, um, so we deploy to production every time uh, changes are merged to the main branch. So with the last month, I guess 151 times. Uh, and then, well, if you multiply it on all the apps, then it's much more. So we're continuously deploying to production. Yeah. Yes? Uh, what's used for change detection? Do you know what app to put in your pipeline and deploy? Is that MX or something else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, our build uh, monorepo management tool, NX, takes care of all of this for us. Um, so we can. We can, for example, write uh, a command that says NX affected uh, graph, and it will spin up a graph and, oh wait, and it will list all the affected projects uh, and make sure uh, this all works. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, would you say it's the newcomers onboarding into a repo is easy? Or onboarding new people? Uh, someone's nodding over here, so. <laughs> colleague of mine um, yeah that's that is the goal right the whole reason we want to have a monorepo is to make the developer experience easier um, to make it easier to you know do authentication the null cut way to yeah do all these true well there's a lot you could know um, but really you don't have to know much about NX, for example, to get going. So we have a, a short readme, I think, yeah, it's maybe an A4 page of how you set up and get your permissions for things and clone the repo and run your first app. So no, I don't think it's too difficult to get going. Yeah, yes. Oh yeah, all the time. Yeah. Um, but this is not a problem because, well, people are working on different parts of the system, right? So, um, yeah, people are working their apps, their libs. Um, so you're not, except for when you do these big refactorings or big upgrades, you're not really treading on each other's toes. It works quite well. Yep. Um, no, we don't do that, uh, but that's something we have in our backlog to uh, look into. Um, or at least uh, we want to make it clear <laughs> to whoever's making this pull request that their change is affecting all of these projects. Um, so no, we don't currently do that, but something like that, uh, or being able to get notified when someone does this uh, is something we want to look into. Mm -hmm. Yes. Has it been uh, difficult to prioritize changes across teams, or has it gone fairly? Um, well, 
actually we're in the luxurious situation that my team has like 80% of all the projects. So, I mean, for us it's worked great. <laughs> um, but uh, what we, we really do try to take other teams into account and we know people have you know, their deadlines and things they're working on. So we want to make it as easy as possible for them to go in and do the changes um, by, and also giving people enough warning and, uh, yeah. So few people, so far not so much problems. Uh, yes. So you're kind of as a board on this, but, but do you see any idea in having dedicated roles in such an environment? Oh, absolutely. So you know, as soon as you get more than two or three teams working, uh, this thing becomes its own platform, um, which needs dedicated people to keep it working and yeah, prevent it from getting out of control. Um, so that is the direction we're going, yeah. <laughs> yes, more questions. Yeah, yeah. So, no, we don't have a smart way of doing this. Um, well, one thing we do, we have this graveyarding process. Um, so, if one project is being extra difficult, um, we can leave it behind. <laughs> That's kind of like the only way to go. Your monorepo goes forward, and yeah, if you're going to be in there, you got to keep up. So, if we remove you from the main branch, we don't have to delete uh, your service immediately, which means, okay, you have time to get back in there and get your upgrade. So that's, yeah, we try to avoid it, but that is one, one way you could do it. Okay, last question, I think, because my time's up. Um, I hope so. I mean, uh, we're we're gonna try, and and you want to always look ahead and see what risks risks are coming, um, what can happen when your monorepo scales. So, I have no idea, uh, but we're go we're gonna try our best. Yeah. Ah, totally. Yeah. So. All of a sudden, there's other people in there, uh, and then you get really uh, embarrassed because you're still in React 17, for example. Uh, and it kind of, no judgments if you're still in React 17. Uh, but uh, yeah, it kind of gives you a push to like, yeah, to keep your house in order. Really, it's like having guests. <laughs> you want them to feel welcome. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, feel free to come and talk to me after. Uh, that was my time. Yeah.